Perfect. We'll just give it one more minute. All right, welcome everyone to the University of New Mexico Lawn Mental Health Didactic Series. This series is hosted by the University of New Mexico Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and the New Mexico Behavioral Health Services Division. We're so glad to have you all here joining us today. My name is Julie Bravko. I'm an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Uh, don't forget, next week we have Dr. Rick Demir presenting on forensic report writing. Um, for our talk today, please ask your questions in the Q&A anytime you feel comfortable. Just know that we're not going to get to them until the end. As always, we try to get to uh, as many of your questions as possible, but please forgive me ahead of time if we can't get to yours. For those of you who are here for CEs but are on a tight schedule, you do have to stay for the full hour, but you don't have to stay longer than that. So I'll try and let you know when the hour is passed, uh, but just know we'll likely be staying on a little bit longer to address questions. Now, those of you who are here for CMEs, the medical CEs, you want to go to the sign in in the chat now. For those of you who want the APA CEs or the, the other mental health CEs, you're going to wait uh, until the, about the last five minutes of the talk today. We're going to post a link to our survey, which you want to complete. After you complete the survey, the certificate will pop up. You want to make sure you print a copy, save a copy, screenshot a copy, whatever you need to do, save it for your records because we don't email those out. Um, as for the recording link and the PowerPoint, we will be distributing those. They should be up uh, in about a week. So make sure you give us about a week. If it, you, know, you can't find it after that, uh, please reach out and let us know. All right, so now it's time for what we've all been waiting for. I'd like to introduce to you our speaker for today, Dr. Lisa Drago Pachowski. Dr. Drago Pachowski is a forensic psychologist in private practice in Annapolis, Maryland. She's board certified in forensic psychology and specializes in civil matters, especially in the areas related to employment, including disability, workers' compensation, fitness for duty, ADA, wrongful termination, security clearance, harassment, and discrimination. She's the author of the book, Best Practices in Forensic Mental Health Assessment, Evaluation of Workplace Disability, as well as many other book chapters and articles related to these areas of practice. She served as the president of the American Board of Professional Psychology, chair of the APA Committee on Professional Practice and Standards, and co-chair of the APA Committee on Legal Issues. She's an adjunct professor in uh, clinical psychology at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology in Washington, DC. Um, Dr. Drago Pachowski, thank you so much for being willing to present for our series today. I'm honored to welcome you. And on behalf of the University of New Mexico, I want you to know that we are so grateful for your time and expertise today. I'm now gonna turn it over to you. Thanks so much, I appreciate it. Um, so hello everyone. Um, I'm gonna be talking about some concepts in the forensic assessment of disability. Um, before I begin, I just wanna make one correction to the bio that Dr. Broco read. Um, I was actually president of the American Board of Forensic Psychology, not the um, American uh, Board of Professional Psychology. So just that clarification. Um, in any case, this is a talk that I typically give in about seven hours. And so when I was asked to do this, uh, address this topic in an hour, I tried to think of the best way to approach this. And um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to focus on three concepts that I want to talk about that I think are central to the forensic assessment of disability. So let me move through these slides, uh, but let me stop here and just say that uh, the views expressed in this presentation are mine and mine alone. They don't necessarily represent the views, policies, or positions of the University of New Mexico or anyone else other than myself. 
And the um, learning objectives for today are to explain the importance of correctly identifying the definition of disability, uh, to explain why functional capacity is more important than diagnosis in disability evaluations, and to identify three sources of data for disability evaluation. So in thinking how I wanted to address this topic, as I said, in an hour, um, I got a question recently from a colleague, and I kind of use this question from my colleague as a starting point um, or uh, as a way to start thinking about these issues. So here's the question from my colleague. So my colleague said that she was doing a workplace threat assessment uh, for an employee who works for in a warehouse for a large retail company. And the employee has said that she's disabled from a traumatic brain injury, which my colleague thought had been malingered. Uh, and this is my colleague's words. She's angry that she hasn't been given accommodations. I think she has paranoid personality disorder. She could distort any comment into a direct insult and reacts with hostility, accusations, and demands. At times, she loses control of anger, argues, and shouts. My question, this is my colleague's question, is she obviously cannot work with people with paranoid personality disorder at this level qualify for a disability, even though it's not technically a mental illness? So that was the question that she presented me with. And I came back with several questions for her, and this is going to be the basis for my talk today. So the first part of my talk, I'm calling Disabled Says Who. And the reason um, I'm using this title is because the first thing that you need to do if you are trying to understand whether someone is disabled or not is to understand the specific legal definition of disability that's applicable for that person. There's no such thing as being disabled that is irrespective of a legal context. Because when I'm talking about disability in terms of forensic evaluation, I'm talking about a legal construct, not a, not a clinical construct. So when we use the word disability, in the same way if we were talking about criminal cases, we use the word competency, we're talking about it with a very specific legal definition. So the first thing that one has to do when you're thinking about trying to understand disability from a forensic standpoint is what is the legal standard? What is the legal definition of disability? For this? So as I just mentioned, we're thinking about disability right now as a legal term rather than a psychological or metal, medical term. Okay, that's, that's one thing to keep in mind. The second thing is that disability is contextually defined. It doesn't exist separate from a specific context. Now, generally speaking, there's three areas that fit into disability evaluation. The first area has to do with claims for disability benefits. This is, for example, disability insurance, social security, workers' compensation. So in those situations, people are making a claim for benefits based on the fact that they believe they're disabled. The second area is in fitness for duty evaluations, which has to do with determining whether someone is capable of performing the duties of their occupation in a safe manner. And the third is determining eligibility for legal protection. Now, this is, for example, under ADA. Um, now, each of these disability programs has a unique legal definition of disability, and they're not interchangeable. Even two federal programs like ADA and IDEA uh, and Social Security, those are three federal programs. They all have very different definitions of disability. So to be considered disabled, an individual has to meet the definition of disability for the specific program under which the eligibility is sought. I'm gonna talk about the three of these areas in a little more detail. And the, the, the three things, these are all examples of those areas. And they're, they're all relevant to the case that my colleague presented. So the first, one as falls in the, the category of eligibility for benefits, and this is workers' compensation. So the idea behind workers' compensation is that it was to provide benefits for workers who become injured or ill on the job. And the idea behind coming up with workers' compensation was that it would relieve um, the employee from having to sue the employer to obtain some kind of financial compensation and would also relieve the employer from having to constantly defend lawsuits from employees who were injured. Of course, what's resulted is an extremely complex uh, system of, uh, of workers' compensation that I'm not sure streamlines anything. But in any case, um, what's important about, or what's different about um, 
workers' compensation or other kinds of disability is that the causation of the illness or injury is a critical factor. In other words, the, the thing that causes the disability, whether it's an illness or injury, has to come out of the individual's job. Okay. Now, except for some few federal programs, all workers' compensation benefits are handled differently in each state. So there's not one sort of universal workers' compensation um, definition or standard. Um, they're governed by statutes, by case law and administrative practice. There are some federal programs that cover um, civilian employees of the federal government, maritime workers, and then civilian employees who are working on US defense bases overseas. So these are all federal programs. But other than this, everything is state-based. <coughs> when there is a dispute, sorry, when there is a dispute, the claims are decided by a special administrative agencies utilizing administrative law judges. Now, the second area I want to talk about is fitness for duty. And these evaluations are typically initiated by an employer to assess an employee's capacity to perform their job duties in a safe and competent manner when they believe there might be a mental impairment of some kind. And these are often prompted by changes in the employee's behavior that's either seen as like disruptive or bizarre or threatening in some way. And when other issues are presumed uh, or when there are other issues presumed to involve the employee's mental health that interfere with their work performance, you know, for example, if there's a question of intoxication or, or perhaps loss of cognitive ability, uh, someone becomes forgetful, things like that. So the, the issue is, is the employer has identified there's issues with regard to the employee's performance, and they want to know whether this is due to some kind of a mental illness, mental condition, cognitive issue, or if it's due to something else. Um, the focus on these evaluations is how the employee's mental or emotional condition impacts their ability to perform the essential functions of their job in a safe and effective manner with or without accommodation. I'm gonna talk about accommodations in a minute when I talk about ADA. Um, now, like other disability evaluations, fitness for duty evaluations involve comparing the employee's functional capacity, in other words, what they do or can do to the requirements of the job they're being asked to do. Now, because fitness for duty evaluations are typically employer mandated, in other words, the employee is told they need to participate in this evaluation if they want to keep the job. There's some conflicts uh, that are uh, potentially, that will potentially arise in terms of legal, financial, and safety consequences for everyone involved. So as a psychologist or a psychiatrist or someone performing one of these evaluations, it's important to be aware of what's involved in that context and the fact that this context creates a tension between the needs of the employer to maintain a safe and productive workplace and the privacy rights of the employee. Now, the third area I wanna talk about is eligibility for legal protections. And in this specifically, I'm gonna talk about ADA or the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. Now, a person who meets the definition of disability under ADA are entitled protection from discrimination by employers um, either because they're perceived as having a disability, they actually have a disability, or have a history of having a disability. And the definition of disability under ADA is that there's a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, record of such impairment, or being regarded as having such an impairment. Now, these evaluations are triggered can be triggered in several ways. They can be triggered by an employee who wants to seek accommodations from the employer. Um, then an employer, uh, when an employer needs to understand if the employee's behavior is due to disability or something else, or when the employee seeks to return to work after they've taken a long leave of absence for mental health treatment. So just to summarize this information, because disability is a legal construct, Knowing the correct definition of disability is always the first step that you need to take. Failing to do so, failing to understand that definition of disability can lead to incorrect assumptions and conclusions and likely a faulty evaluation because it will not address the necessary legal criteria. 
So let's go back to my colleague's question. So when I said disabled says who, well, what do we know about this employee? We know the employee was seeking accommodations because my, my colleague mentioned that in her question. And this suggests that she was seeking disability under ADA. So now we have an idea of what the definition is. So now ADA defines disability as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity for a, a record of such impairment or being regarded as having such an impairment. That's the legal definition. Now, a paranoid personality disorder can qualify for disability under ADA. Okay? So it's not excluded from that. That could certainly be the cause of disability under ADA. However, knowing this information is not sufficient to determine disability. Okay, so this leads us to part two, and I'm calling this diagnosis not equal disability. So first let's talk for a minute about what diagnosis means. Okay. A diagnosis is basically a label um, that describes a co-occurrence of symptoms. So when an individual presents, whether it's a, a medical condition or a mental health condition, that there are certain symptoms that seem to cluster together. And we come up with labels to name those clusters of symptoms so that we can classify the individual's condition into separate and distinct categories. So we can differentiate between someone who's presenting, say, with depression, and someone with anxiety. This helps us uh, in a clinical sense, decide what kind of treatment is appropriate for that person. Now, it's important to understand that mental health um, diagnoses are, are just um, constructed concepts. They don't necessarily have a one-to-one -one correspondence between some specific underlying defining condition. Right? It's not like you can take a test to determine, like, for example, like you can take a test to determine if you have COVID. You can't take a test to determine if you have depression. There's no marker sense. So these are just labels. They're convenient ways that we've designed to communicate information among other professionals. So if one uh, treatment provider sees a patient who they believe has depression, they can refer to the person, to the psychiatrist, say for medication consult, say, this is a person who's presenting with depression. And without giving a ton of other information, the psychiatrist probably has some grasp of how the person but that's what we talk about when we're talking about what a, a diagnosis is. Now, diagnosis does not determine disability. Okay? It's not the specific diagnosis that's important. It's what the person can and can't do in light of having a mental health condition, whatever that might be. And this is a very important concept um, in the forensic assessment of disability is that Disability is basically an assessment of functional capacity, capacity and not diagnosis. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. So when we talk about functional capacity, um, regardless of what the source of disability uh, benefits is or what the program or circumstances under which a person is seeking disability, we're always talking about functional capacity, not diagnosis. Okay. This is absolutely distinct from diagnosis. And what functional capacity is important is determined by the context the person is in and the role the person is required to fill in that context. So for example, a, um, uh, the demands of the context of say being an accountant is different than demands of a con context of say being a carpenter. Those are very different demands of that context. And so we talk about functional capacity, we're talking about functional capacity as related to that particular context. So in terms of occupational disability, we're talking about functional capacity being the person's ability to perform the important duties of his or her job. So let me talk a little bit more about some of the terms that we're using here. As I said, diagnosis is a label that's designed to efficiently, efficiently communicate information among professionals. Now, when I use the word condition, I'm talking about the specific manifestations of the psychological distress or cognitive compromise. And this has nothing to do, with, it's not directly related to the diagnostic label. So if you think about condition as being what's actually going on with the person, regardless of what we call it. That's sort of the, the almost 
um, their, their true state given um, their, their mental health functioning. Okay. Now, when I talk about functioning, I'm talking about the ability to do something. So functioning always involves uh, accomplishment of something or, or working to do something, perform an activity. The word impairment talks about the diminishment or loss of ability so that the, it, the, there's a um, expected level of functioning and if there's an impairment, then the person's level of functioning has declined or diminished from what that expected level was. When I talk about context, I'm talking about the circumstances under which the person is required to perform any activity. Now, one of the terms that I prefer to use when I talk about doing disability evaluation um, as a psychologist is the idea of work capacity. Because as I said before, disability is really a legal determination and that's kind of the ultimate issue question. So when we talk about um, work capacity, I'm talking about the person's ability to perform their job duties in light of a mental health condition. So that's actually what we're evaluating is work capacity, not making a determination of disability. Now, simply having a mental health issue does not mean that people can't work because many people with mental health issues continue to function in the workplace. Um, and the second thing to keep in mind is that the diagnosis doesn't determine the work capacity, okay? Because you could have two individuals who have the same diagnosis who function quite differently. Okay? So it's the, their ability to function within the context of the demands of the occupational setting that is important, not the specific diagnosis. And work impairment, the nature of the work impairment isn't specific to or dispositive of any one diagnosis. So if I said to you bipolar disorder, right, you might be able to assume that there may be some impairment in work functioning, but just knowing the person's diagnosis isn't sufficient to determine what degree, if any impairment in the person's work functioning exists. So you can't just rely on a diagnosis to provide information about functional capacity. So just to say a little bit more about that, uh, again, we cannot infer functioning from diagnosis. Very few mental disorders preclude all types of functioning. There's, there's very few disorders that, that, that would lead to a person not being able to function at all. Um, also, you have other factors such as the variability of the symptom presentation, what the person's premorbid capacity was, what the demands of the situation is. So you could have two individuals with the same diagnosis, but can actually function quite differently because of these factors. Okay. And the third point is, is that many mental disorders are chronic or episodic. So symptoms can wax and wane over time. The person isn't necessarily going to have the same level of symptoms from point A to point B. Uh, person might be relatively stable for a period of time and their functioning might be unimpaired or only mildly impaired. At other times during a period of exacerbation, they may be very compromised in their functioning. So again, that's something that can't be inferred from the diagnosis. Now, when I talk about functional abilities, um, I'm talking about the specific abilities that are required to perform a task. So if you think about job duties, which are the sort of the things that you do in the course of your job, the, the important things that you're required to do, um, you know, for example, if, if maybe a person, one of their job duties is to maintain a spreadsheet, okay? the functional abilities that underlie that job duty would be things like computer skills, numeric skills, attention and concentration, and many other things. But those are the basic skills that allow the person to perform that job duty. And by performing that job duty and other necessary duties allows the person to fulfill the requirements of their job. Now, another thing that I want to distinguish is symptoms and functional abilities, okay? We talk about symptoms. Symptoms are subjective, right? So you can ask a person how depressed they feel or how tired they feel or um, how anxious they feel. Those are all subjective. Symptoms are usually not observable. So you usually can't observe how depressed someone is. I mean, you could see signs that suggest the person's depressed, but it's not, it, you cannot directly observe depression. Symptoms are also problem focused. So we're always sort of focusing as clinicians on how to treat or eliminate a symptom. 
if that's something we want to get rid of. On the other hand, when talking about functional abilities, functional abilities are objective and, and measurable and observable. So if you think about, for example, um, numerical ability, you could have a person demonstrate their numerical ability. Um, you could have a person uh, you could test their concentration, for example. So these are things that are all potentially observable and measurable. And they're also action focused. So they're all about accomplishing, doing something. It's not just about an internal experience. It's about what you can actually do. And we try to enhance a person's functional abilities, right? Those are things that we want to increase, uh, not to eliminate. So here's some examples of some functional abilities. And there's literally thousands of functional abilities that could be relevant. Um, and so these are just some ideas. Understanding verbal instructions, communicating thoughts and writing, being able to remember information, following directions, maintaining composure under stress, controlling anger, solving novel problems, decision-making. All of these are examples of functional abilities that may or may not be relevant to a particular person's context and job. So I said impairments. Um, have to do with a loss of ability. And this is, and, and we talk about functional impairments arise when the symptoms of a mental health condition diminish the person's functional capacity. So when a person's depression interferes with their concentration, you know, we can say that their concentration has been impaired. They now have a functional impairment. They're less able to concentrate or can't concentrate for as long because of the um, symptom that is causing the impairment. So one way to think about um, these, how these uh, things kind of interact um, is something that Gold and Schumann um, talk about, this sort of supply and demand model of, of, of demands and abilities. So they talk about disability being an interaction between the functional abilities of the person and the demands of the person's occupation. So when you have a situation in which the demands of the occupation exceed the person's functional abilities, that would be a situation in which you might describe the person as being disabled. So to assess disability, um, you want to generate objective data about several things. One is whether the person has a valid condition because we're linking these impairments in functioning, this, this decrement in their ability to perform at work with a condition. So the first thing would be to determine if the person in fact does have a valid condition. The second thing would be determining what functional impairments result from this condition. So if the person does have depression and, you, and you're able to determine or find information that suggests to you that this is a valid condition, the person is experiencing depression, then what functional impairments result from that depression? Are they impaired in terms of their concentration? Are they uh, impaired in terms of their ability to complete tasks quickly? Um, so the functional impairments resulting from the condition would be the second thing that you need to focus on assessing. And then the third thing would be the extent to which these impairments compromise the examinee's ability to function in a work setting. So as we mentioned earlier, different settings have different demands, different jobs have different demands. So something that would be very problematic in one context or setting is not at all problematic or minimally problematic in other setting. So generally speaking, uh, as with all areas of forensic practice, you, you want to obtain data from multiple sources um, and you're looking to cross validate information across sources and to get a, a complete picture of the individual's functioning by looking at different sources. So the sources that are typically used in disability evaluation are clinical interview, um, behavioral observations, which, which I think is extremely helpful in a disability evaluation, as I'm sure most evaluations. But um, you know, for example, if a person is saying, I, I can't do my job because I can't remember things, I, or I can't, I can't focus on anything for more than 15 minutes, and you observe that the person is answering questions very readily for three hours, okay, that's a behavioral observation that would be relevant to you understanding the validity of the complaint of concentration problems. 
Another source of data could be psychological testing. Um, obviously, reviewing records and documents is very useful. Um, the kinds of records and documents that are helpful, obviously, are those that are, that are contemporaneous. In other words, they were created contemporaneously at the time of the observation was being made. Things like uh, school records, work records, um, discipline at work, for example. Um, obviously, medical records and psychological mental health treatment records are all very important. And then collateral informants, um, people that have good information or observations about how the person is functioning in different contexts. Um, that would include things like mental health treatment providers or family members or coworkers, anyone who might have information that will help you develop a, a more nuanced and complete picture of how the person is functioning. So in terms of psychological testing, it can be very useful in these kinds of evaluations, but there are limits. So tests can provide information about how the examinee is functioning psychologically. It can help you identify personality traits and acute and chronic symptoms of stress. Um, tests can provide information about a person's cognitive functioning. It can help you cross-validate information from other sources. And testing can provide information about the person's response style. However, there's no test that can determine if someone is disabled. We don't have tests that we can't give someone a test to say if you're capable of working as, account, as an accountant or as a carpenter. Um, so you always, when you're using psychological tests, you're trying to extrapolate data from the test and apply it to the questions that are relevant to the evaluation. And I think you have to take care in terms of not over extrapolating the data to a work situation. Now, the idea of dissimulation or malingering and disability evaluation is something that needs to be considered. Over the years, there have been a number of different estimates in terms of what the base rate of malingering is or dissimulation is in disability cases. Um, it's ranged from the low estimate was 7.5. I think the high estimate was something like 40%. Um, it's quite a range. It's difficult to know exactly what the true base rate is, but it's significant enough that it needs to, that the dissimulation and response style need to be addressed in every disability evaluation. It's common enough that it may play a role and it needs to be either ruled in or ruled out. When you are going to use um, symptom validity measures or performance validity measures um, to assess response style, you need to consider the appropriateness of the instrument for the population. Um, so in other words, is this has this test been normed on individuals that are similar to the you're examining um, and psychometric properties of the instrument? Uh, this is particularly relevant in terms of instruments that have cut scores or classification when you're trying to classify a person as being honest versus malingering or um, and, and you need to clearly understand how those cut stores, scores were derived, what the um, likelihood of a false positive might be or false negative for that matter. Keeping in mind that people can feign cognitive symptoms and not psychiatric symptoms or vice versa, regardless of what their stated claim is. Um, it's always advised to use more than one measure and um, you never determine whether a person is uh, malingering based on test results alone. You have to use this in concert with other information, observations, other data we talked about earlier in order to reach an opinion about that. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind with regard to assessing malingering is that you can have malingering as well as actual symptoms and deficits. So a person might be malingering um, the extent of their depression, but they still might have depression that causes um, deficits in their functioning. Um, or the person might be malingering, uh, for example, in my colleague's question, she thought that the person was malingering traumatic brain injury, uh, which she didn't see, but she thought that there might be a personality disorder that was causing deficits. So just don't assume that malingering precludes the existence of actual symptoms. You wanna also consider other forms of distortion that can be unconscious or un unintended. So sometimes people misrepresent, not because they're trying to linger, but because they're either unaware or uninformed. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, 
And then also you need to think about cultural differences and how that could be influencing the examinee's presentation. So to go on with that, what I was just speaking about in terms of what are some of the other causes other than intentional lingering, misunderstanding is one. So a person may not understand their condition well. They may misunderstood something the treatment provider said to them. You know, if a treatment provider says, well, don't put yourself under stress. You know, you need to, you need to relax, you need to take it easy. They might misunderstand that as being told that they're not capable of, of working or not capable of working in any kind of stressful environment. Poor recall is another reason that people sometimes present misinformation. Um, so they might not recall um, when they first started treatment or the fact that they were actually in treatment years ago um, or when they first started not feeling well. Um, so poor recall um, is something to consider. Personality factors, uh, which can kind of go both ways. I mean, you could have someone who um, has a high level of narcissism and they have a more inflated view of their, their abilities and their, um, their, their uh, self-presentation. Um, and then manifestations of the actual condition. For example, sometimes people who are depressed or feel hopeless and pessimistic. So they may have a very negative view of their own ability to recover from the condition or to be able to, to perform in a work environment, even though that might not actually be objectively true. Um, cultural issues, as I mentioned, can also influence response style. Now, part of the problem is that there hasn't been a lot of research that has examined the accuracy of some of these measures with culturally diverse samples. Um, so when you're looking at using some of these measures with someone who did not fit that group on which the test was normed, you want to think about you know, the kind of cut scores that you're using and, and how that might change the specificity or uh, the sensitivity of a particular measure. Um, there may be potential biases in a measure because it wasn't designed for um, someone in that population. Um, an example I can think of off the top of my head is the SIMS. Um, the SIMS has several questions that are very US centric. Um, it asks about the first president of the country. It asks about how many states there are. So now, obviously, uh, those are the kinds of questions that a person who grew up in the United States would readily answer. But if you grew up in, say, um, Guatemala, you might not be able to readily answer those questions. If you get the questions wrong, it might look like you're malingering. So um, that's something to consider. Um, Language-based issues, uh, when people either don't speak English, uh, well or well enough, or there might be inaccurate translation or comprehension issues um, in terms of the kind of translation that's used. Um, cultural variations in symptom presentation. Um, so you might have someone who presents as not typical of a mental disorder uh, as conceived of by the developer of the test. So this person is presenting typically as people with schizophrenia present, um, but nevertheless might have that condition. And again, just to reiterate this, you have to use great care when you're interpreting cut scores and classification based on these instruments when the, the appropriate norms don't exist with individuals from that population. Okay, so now let's go back to my colleague's question again. Um, so diagnosis is not equal disability. So let's talk about her diagnostic and, and, uh, and functional assessment of this person. So but my colleague did not find support for the traumatic brain injury. She thought that was malingered. However, she did find support for the paranoid personality disorder. So that that's that so now we have a valid condition, the paranoid personality disorder. And then my colleague described impairments in interpersonal functioning marked by misinterpreting comments, shouting, angry outbursts, making accusations, arguing, making inappropriate demands. These are all functional impairments that could support a finding of disability, okay? But we still need to do more because we don't know how relevant those particular functional abilities would be to this person's work situation. And we need to make sure that these are connected causally with her condition and not due to something else. And this brings us to the third section of my talk today, I'm calling this Just Because. There has to be a causal connection between the observed work impairment and the mental health condition. 
So when you're approaching a disability evaluation, there needs to be a thread that starts from having valid symptoms that lead to functional impairments that are causally related to those valid symptoms that are relevant to the contextual demands the person finds themselves finds themselves in. And then that can lead to an opinion. Okay? But that thread has to start with the valid symptoms through the functional impairments of the contextual demands. So we wanna think about how um, the interaction between the person, what the person is bringing to, to bear and the situation itself. So we're trying to explain how an individual's mental health condition interacts with the demands of their work environment and how their work capacity is affected as a result of that. So you always wanna draw a connection between the manifestations of the individual's mental health condition and the specific impairments in their functioning. And then you need to extrapolate those functional impairments to the requirements of their job. As I, as I mentioned earlier, those functional abilities underlie the specific job duties that a person is required to perform. So again, you have to go back, you have to be able to see if those functional impairments are related to job duties that they're required to perform and whether those job duties um, would then render the person, the inability to perform those job duties would render the person incapacitated. So one of the ways that impairments can interact with um, the situation have to do with demands of the environment. Okay, for example, let's say we have a machine operator in a factory who has depression. And because of this depression, the person is not sleeping well, they have regular struggles with insomnia, and this leads to afternoon fatigue and sleepiness. Okay. So let's think about some of the variables that might change the effect of this fact, if you will. Okay, let's say, what if the person works an early shift and is off by 3 p.m.? They get sleepy around four o'clock. So maybe their sleepiness isn't going to affect their work um, because by the time they're ready for their nap, they're already out of work, okay? What if the person is able to take a coffee break whenever they're feeling sleepy? You know, go and take a, get some fresh air, have a cup of coffee or tea or something, and that helps them become more alert and less sleepy. What if the person is operating machinery that's unlikely to cause injury if they are sleepy? Okay, that would change the equation. On the other hand, what if the person is operating heavy machinery where they could easily sustain an injury to themselves or other people. That would be a very different story. What if the person can't take a break when they need to take a break and they can only take breaks at certain scheduled times? So if the break doesn't occur at the time the person becomes sleepy, they would be unable to sort of revive themselves um, and get back to work. And what finally, if the person is not allowed to take any breaks during the afternoon, that would prevent the person from being able to, um, accomplish, to take any steps to make themselves get through that period. So you can see how it could be very different depending on the demands of the specific situation the person is in. On the other hand, another variable of this has to do with the severity of the symptoms and the impact it has. Now let's take another example. So we have a college professor who has to give lectures to large classes. And this professor develops a specific phobia regarding public speaking. So what happens? Well, there could be a range of impairments related to that. Um, the first one would be, for example, they feel a little uncomfortable, but they're still able to lecture. So they're not feeling really great when they're lecturing, but they're still able to do it. The next level would be they feel pretty uncomfortable and they sometimes lose their place in the lecture notes or they stumble over words. So they're, you're starting to see a change in the actual output that they're giving. The third level would be the person feels very uncomfortable and often avoids lecturing or stops the lecture early, maybe stops after 20 minutes or um, calls out sick on days they have to lecture. And then the, the, the most severe level would be the person uh, can't make themselves speak in front of a class at all. Okay. So you can see that, that with, given the level of symptoms, how that could affect a person in different ways. Now, it's very important to differentiate what we call situational factors from disability factors. So this goes back to the whole causality issue is that you have to have a causal connection between the, um, the symptoms the person is having and the impairment in their work functioning. 
Now, some other factors that aren't related to um, the person's mental health would be things like economic problems. So let's say, for example, the person um, is uh, unable, say, say it moves to an area where the salaries are very low and they might actually be able to make more money if they had disability benefits that they were working, that would create a disincentive to work. So uh, having an economic problem might be an incentive to file a disability. That doesn't mean you don't have a disability, but it's certainly something that you have to rule out the effect of that versus the effect of the condition. Um, lack of interest in career. Sometimes people lose interest in doing whatever it was they were trained to do or typically were doing, and they might have no desire to continue in that. Another area would be legal problems. Um, say a um, psychologist license uh, is disciplined because of um, uh, behaviors that they engaged in, or problems that they had. Um, they might find their ability to earn a living compromised by that. Um, a desire to relocate or to avoid relocating. Maybe a person wants to move to another state because a partner or a family member wants to be there or what's a change of pace, or the person's company uh, or employer is asking them to relocate. They don't want to do that because of those factors. Again, that's not a disability factor. That's a situational factor. And then finally, the need to care for family members. So um, if you, um, uh, for example, have a sick partner or spouse or child, uh, the person might want to stay home and take care of that person. Um, however, that's not the person's disability. It might be a disability for the person being cared for. That's not the same as having a disability. So the way to think about these things is to think about if these factors were removed, would the person still be able to perform their important job functions? Um, another consideration is how culture can impact disability assessment. Um, thinking about, for example, how mental health, mental illness is expressed in an examinee's culture. You know, in some cultures, for example, physical or somatic symptoms are much more acceptable than, than emotional distress symptoms. So a person can present, again, in a way that's not typical of, um, for example, anxiety. You know, a person might be uncomfortable saying, I'm very nervous and anxious, but say I have problems in my stomach or I have headaches all the time, uh, because that's more acceptable. Um, Cultural attitudes toward help seeking for mental health professionals. Um, you know, is that something that if you see a person who has not sought treatment for a mental health condition, is it because they really don't have a condition, it's not that severe, or maybe it's because there's a lot of pressure not to do something like that because of cultural issues. Um, maybe it's not acceptable to discuss personal problems outside of the family. Sometimes shame can play a role in acknowledging symptoms or problems, um, that, that there would be uh, a lot of pressure not to acknowledge that a person is struggling. So there might be a lack of, say, records that, that provide support for the fact that problems have been going on for a long time. Um, the use of uh, things like psychotropic medication, um, is, is that seen as something that's okay or is a person resisting that, not because they don't have se severe symptoms, but because it's not acceptable. Um, then are cultural differences being misunderstood as symptoms of mental health issue or personality disorder? You know, are, are the, is the way the person behaving, maybe the person being very quiet and deferential, is that seen as being uh, the person is socially withdrawn or um, it's uh, social anxiety, or is that really a reflection of cultural issues? Um, do cultural norms uh, encourage acquiescence to authority figures like the health professionals um, so the person is going along with it? And then, of course, are psychological tests both linguistically and culturally acceptable and appropriate for this examining? So in terms of um, possible opinions that you can have on after disability evaluation, one opinion is that the person doesn't have a genuine condition because remember we talked about that that um, that linkage between that person's valid symptoms and then the functional impairments, et cetera. So maybe they don't have a genuine condition. Um, maybe the, the either the symptoms don't rise to the level of an actual condition. For example, 
someone says, um, you know, um, my significant other broke up with me and I feel sad. That's not necessarily a diagnosable condition. You know, it, that's kind of a normal reaction to a sad situation um, in, some, in some cases. So maybe the person doesn't have a genuine condition or maybe they've lingered their symptoms. Um, the second level would be, and this is only applicable to workers' compensation, is that the person has a genuine condition, but it's not related to a work injury. So maybe they do actually have depression, but it wasn't caused by something that happened at work. It was caused by a divorce that they went through. Okay. A third level of opinion could be the person has a genuine condition, but there's no functional impairments that interfere with the person's ability to work. Okay. So if, um, let's, I mean, maybe you sort of think of in terms of physical capacity. So let's say a person had a back injury that prevents them from lifting more than 20 pounds. Well, if you're a carpenter, that might be a huge problem because you're not able to to move wood and, and tools and things like that. But if you're working as an accountant at a desk, maybe that's not relevant to your work. Okay, the next level would be the person is unable to perform work duties for reasons that are not related to illness or injury. Those are some of the situational factors that we talked about. So things like needing to care for a family member or losing their professional license may prevent them from performing their work duties, but that's not related to an illness or injury. And then the final level would be the person does have a genuine condition and has functional impairments that interfere with the performance of their job. So let's go back one more time to my colleague's question. So my colleague established that the impairments in the employee's interpersonal functioning were because of the symptoms of paranoid personality disorder. So now we have that causal connection between the symptoms of the disorder and those functional impairments that she noted that included things like angry outbursts and, and threats and things like that. Okay. Now, as a warehouse worker, the employee works as part of a team and has to interact with coworkers and supervisors. Okay. So she is required to interact with others as part of her job. That's a necessary part of her job. She can't not do that. There's no way to kind of put her in a corner and let her work just by herself. That, the environment requires that. So now we've established that those functional impairments are relevant to her situation. That her deficits in interpersonal functioning would certainly interfere with her ability to perform the duties of the job. So to answer my colleague's question, it's very possible that this employee would qualify for disability under ADA. All right, and here are just some selected references. Um, that um, are things I mentioned in my talk. And I would be happy to take questions if anyone has. All right, thank you so much. We do have a number of questions. Um, the first one is, in fitness evaluations, does the forensic examiner typically give an opinion on the ultimate question? Um, no. Um, it depends. Um, I guess that's not a very good answer, but it depends. In some in some situations, in cases, um, there the examiner is asked to do that. However, if you're not explicitly asked, in my opinion, it's better not to do that. It's better to, to talk about work capacity. You know that, in my opinion, the person's symptoms of depression rise to a level that cause functional impairments in their ability to perform their, their the duties of a elementary school teacher and they could not safely perform these job duties or, or perform their job duties, rather than saying, yes, this person is disabled, because the word disabled really means they're entitled to some legal benefit or, or protection or something. So I try to avoid saying, yes, this person is or is not disabled. Okay. The next question is, what is the source of the specific functional abilities? Is it the patient or employee? Is it the employer? Is it the examining psychologist? Good question. Um, so yes, you want information from all of those sources. Uh, certainly the thing about functional impairments is that you should be able to um, observe some of them to some extent. You know, again, some of them are things like if you're talking about um, say concentration or attention, those are things that can be assessed with psychological testing. Um, they can also be observed to some extent during the evaluation, you know, that if your evaluation, um, you know, for example, if I gave someone an MMPI-3, um, 
with its hundreds of questions and they complete it in, you know, uh, well within the expected amount of time and they don't get confused and they don't lose their place. Um, that speaks to some level of concentration to me. So that's one way to observe that. Certainly information from other sources. Again, you're looking for cross-validation of information. Um, you know, uh, if you're able to say, get information from an employer who says, you know, the, the, the work output is very slow, they're, they're, they're handing things in, but they're way too late or it's incomplete. And then you're getting information, say from a family member who says, you know, like, you know, nothing gets done around the house anymore, you know, then that's kind of cross validation. And maybe you have some information from psychological testing. So the answer is it comes from many sources. And the more kind of cross validation you can get from from sources increases the confidence you can have in that opinion. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. This individual says if they understood correctly, determining disability under ADA is a legal determination. And the suggestion is that we can assess the presence of a condition or diagnosis and functional impairment without necessarily providing a legal opinion on the presence of a disability. Who then determines the presence of a disability? HR departments often want the doctor to attest to the presence of a disability under ADA. So what I would do in that situation is I would look at the requirements of the law and talk about whether or not the person um, hey, has a condition, has a history of the condition. Uh, I would talk about the areas in which it, it, the condition interferes with important life functioning and give examples of that you know, and, and provide all of that information. But it's really up to a judge to say that the person is, is um, eligible for ADA protection. Now, often you're being asked to, to talk about accommodations. So in other words, is this something that can be accommodated? Now, ADA is a whole very complex area of practice. It would take too long to, to go into in any depth here. But, um, you know, you're often being asked like, well, you know, what would this person need to be able to form their, perform their job duty? You know, do they need to be able to take a break in the afternoon because they're sleepy? Or do they need to be able to have time off or have a flexible schedule so they can see their psychiatrist or do they need to work in a um, you know a quieter environment if they have a cubicle that's right across from the elevator where people are going in and out they find that very distracting you know with putting them in a corner or a quieter place help them do their job so you're often asked to talk about things um, that would assist them or accom accommodations that would be appropriate um, now, if you, if in your opinion, there are no accommodations that would allow the person to perform the job effectively, um, you know, uh, for example, let's say the person has lost their sight, and this is again a physical example, and they want to be an Uber driver, right? I can't think of any accommodations, um, unless they do self-driving cars work better than I think they do, um, but they, I can't think of an accommodation that would allow that person. So I, I would say in a, in in that context, although I'm not a medical doctor, I would say something like there's, there are no accommodations that I'm aware of that would allow this person to safely perform the job duties. Mm -hmm. Do you know why the social security disability evaluations um, don't allow validity testing? Do I know why they don't allow validity testing? No, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I did. <laughs> Let's see here. Do you recommend any form of general behavioral functioning like the um, ABOS-3 that's relevant to functional impairments? Uh, again, it depends on the source of information that you have. If you have a good source of information from that, um, generally speaking of disability evaluation, simply asking the person what they can and can't do is not necessarily the most um, reliable method. Um, when I am, and I, I, I didn't include this in this presentation because of the time constraints, but, but one of the ways I encourage people to conduct the clinical interview and, and also interviews with um, collateral sources is to ask for very specific um, ex uh, examples. You know, if someone says, I can't concentrate on anything, okay, tell me something you can't concentrate on. You know, well, I can't concentrate on TV. What kind of a TV, what kind of TV shows do you watch? You know, you watch sports, you watch movies, you know, what is it that you can't concentrate on? How long can you concentrate for? So by really asking for very specific examples and information that can help you get more reliable information and not just accept, yeah, I can't do that. Um, yeah. Okay. 
Well, thank you very, very much for your time today. We You're really, so really appreciate this was fantastic. Um, everyone jump on and grab the, the survey for your CEs and we will see you all next week. Thank you so much. All right, take care.